For some time now, we've been considering Socrates in his capacity as a teacher. Uh, in the Alcibiades I, which, which details the beginning of Socrates' controversial association with the, the always controversial Alcibiades. In the Republic, where Socrates explores the question that Alcibiades had paid insufficient attention to, the question of justice, what justice is and, and in what sense it's good. And finally, in the Protagoras and Gorgias, which contrasts Socrates with his two greatest rivals as teachers, a sophist and a rhetorician. Now, as we've seen, uh, the importance of our moral opinions plays a large role in both of these dialogues. Now, as the final installment in, in our inquiry into Socrates as a teacher, we're going to turn to the Mino. Now, we do so in part because the Mino is clearly connected with both the Protagoras and the Gorgias. The Protagoras culminates in Socrates' assertion that it's necessary to ask the comprehensive question, what is virtue? Which happens to be the guiding question of the Mino. And we soon discover that Mino, the young man after whom our dialogue is named, has been the student of none other than Gorgias. Just as we meet in the Gorgias itself then, um, the product of a Gorgian education, so too in the Mino. We see the, the results, if you will, of the, the education that Gorgias has on offer. And, as with Polis and Callicles, so with Mino. Mino proves not to be a, a ringing endorsement of the, the Gorgian education. Now, Mino is an historical figure, not a, a fictional, fictional one. He hailed from Thessaly, a region north of Athens. And earlier in Lecture 4, I alluded to his rather colorful, notorious political career, and I'll have more to say about that a little later on. Now, by way of introduction, let's begin, as, as we always do, from the most obvious things, the, the surface. The Mino is a performed, rather than a narrated, dialogue. And in it we find four interlocutors. There's Socrates and Mino, of course, then a certain unnamed slave of Mino's, and toward the very end of the dialogue, a leading Athenian politician by the name of Anatus uh, is a friend who is a friend of, of Mino's uh, and who happens to arrive as Socrates and Mino are talking. So we'll encounter An Anatus' name again in the Apology of Socrates. Why? Because Anatus, it turns out, was to become one of the three official accusers of Socrates. And so in this way, the Mino also points ahead to the trial and execution of Socrates. The fate of Socrates hangs over this dialogue very much, as it probably does over all the dialogues. Now, the Mino as a whole falls into three parts of, of unequal length. The first, and by far the longest part, consists of Mino's attempts with Socrates to discover an adequate definition of virtue, or to answer the question, what is virtue? Now, it's true that the question, what is virtue, is not the one from which Mino wants to begin. He wants to know how virtue can be acquired, how he can get it. He says through, through teaching or practice, or is, is virtue present by nature or in some other way? The whole dialogue begins abruptly with Mino's posing just this question. But Socrates insists that before we can know how something is acquired, we have to know first what it is. And so Mino proceeds to give three different definitions of virtue, each of which Socrates finds defective. And this leads then to a kind of protest on Mino's part. He gets fed up with Socrates. In response to that, Socrates states his famous doctrine concerning knowledge. According to that doctrine, knowledge is nothing but recollection. Recollection of things learned in a previous life or lives. And in this section, too, is found the, the single most celebrated part of the dialogue, I suppose. It's Socrates' conversation with one of Mino's slaves, who happens to be standing nearby. And this is an attempt to prove the truth of the so-called recollection doctrine. Again, that all knowledge is somehow recollected from a previous life. 
Socrates is then forced to discuss whether virtue is teachable. And he first gives the answer, yes, it is. But then suddenly changes his tune and says, no, it's not. And of course, we'll have to see the reasons why he changes his tune. It's at this point that Anatus arrives in the dialogue, the uh, Athenian politician, and he ushers in the second and briefest part of the dialogue. It consists of Socrates' polite, but also tense or highly charged conversation with Anatus as to who the best teachers of virtue are. This leads us then to the third, the final, and also quite brief part of the dialogue, in which Socrates returns to, de- to converse with Mino, but this time in the presence of Anatus. Now, in this next lecture and the next one, I want to focus on highlights from each of these three sections. In today's lecture in particular, I'm going to examine with, with some care Mino's three attempts at a definition of virtue. Then I'll make a few remarks about Mino's frustration when all of these attempts of his fail. The Mino is the dialogue on virtue. There are virtues that, that uh, there are dialogues rather, that treat one or more of the specific virtues like justice, courage, moderation, piety, and so on. But only the Mino takes as its theme the comprehensive question, what is virtue? Now, virtue, in my opinion, is the best translation of the Greek term arete, but it can also be rendered as simply excellence, the excellence specific to a thing. So the term virtue, then, is a fairly broad or or elastic term, and and that's a, a fact, I think, that we should keep in mind. In his opening question, Mino wants to know nothing less than the way in which human excellence or human virtue could be acquired. And the alternatives, he states, are are intriguing. If virtue can be acquired by teaching or learning, as as he suggests, it must be rational. Strictly speaking, at least, teaching can convey only things that are, that exist, that are true. For example, you can teach someone mathematics, but not the proper care of, say, a unicorn. That can't be taught. Does human virtue or excellence consist, then, in, in something rational? in something grasped by the human mind, in in some knowledge, in short? Or, as Mino also suggests, is human virtue something present in us by nature, like, say, a, a fine singing voice or height or good looks? If that's so, then it could not be taught or, or even acquired by somebody without the necessary nature. Now, as I've indicated, Socrates insists that they try first to say what virtue is before they attempt to answer Mino's question. And although Mino doesn't much like the delay, he thinks that defining virtue, well, it's nothing that hard. So here then is Mino's definition number one of virtue. Quote, This is the virtue of a man, to be capable of carrying out the affairs of the city, and in doing so, to benefit friends, harm enemies, and take care that he himself not suffer any such thing. And if you want the virtue of a woman, it isn't difficult to define. She must manage the household well by both preserving its contents and being obedient to the man, or husband, as the same word could be translated. And Mino gives us other examples as well, of children and elders and so on. He sums up these examples with the following remark. Quote, The virtue belonging to each of us is related to each task appropriate to each action and time of life. In other words, the virtue or excellence specific to each of us, a man, a woman, a child, an elder, is determined by the task, the work, that's appropriate to each of us. And I think this this makes some sense. Let's say, to take a somewhat silly example, that our highest task as human beings is the, the playing of volleyball. If that were so, then the virtue of human beings could pretty easily be deduced from the nature of that that activity. What does it require? And so on. And for a man, according to Mino, participation in politics is the activity. So the capacity to do this well is virtue, according to him. In the case of both a, a man and a woman, or husband and wife, each looks to the good of a whole greater than himself or herself, the political community, and the household, respectively. 
And so, to repeat, the, the capacity to, to contribute to each of those is virtue. Now, I think this answer is really quite a powerful one. But a passing remark made by Mino points to the direction that Socrates will follow in, in questioning it. Remember that Mino had said that the virtuous man should benefit his friends and harm his enemies. By the way, one of the definitions of justice in the Republic, we remember. And the virtuous man should see to it that he not suffer any harm himself. But this raises a question. Is being virtuous, being a, a dutiful citizen, is it not only not harmful to the virtuous man, but positively good for him? The virtuous man will benefit his friends, Mino says. Will he also benefit himself? This Mino leaves unclear. And so Socrates immediately introduces an understanding of virtue comparable to that of health, the health of the individual man and woman. He asks, how can virtue be different from one kind of human being to another when health is the same? So here then, Socrates introduces the question of the good of the virtuous themselves on the model of, of health. Socrates next brings out Mino's confusion concerning virtue. You say, Mino, that the virtue of a man is, is to manage the affairs of the city well, that of a woman to manage the household well. Fine. But don't you mean in both cases doing so justly and moderately? Mino agrees. Sure, that is what I mean. In fact, as Mino also agrees, all human beings be become good in the same way, by being just and moderate and so on. Now here we can see, if in a very compressed form, the heart of the difficulty. Virtue seems, on the one hand, to be the end, the goal, that to which we would properly dedicate ourselves. And yet virtue also seems to be a means, a means to our becoming good ourselves. Mino, I suggest, is very much attached to moral virtue understood as an end in itself, to which we would rightly dedicate ourselves. And he's attached to virtue, understood as the necessary means to becoming good oneself. But there may well be some tension between these two understandings of virtue. Let me put it this way. Should a man be good in order to serve the city well? Or should he serve the city well in order to become good himself? And this uncertainty leads us to ask, with which good, the city's or his own, is Mino more deeply concerned? Now, all of this prompts Mino to offer his second official definition of virtue. And this time he refers explicitly to his teacher, and our old friend, Gorgias. Mino defines virtue as simply the capacity to rule people, period. This, I think, by the way, is perfectly compatible with what we saw of, of Gorgias' sort of hard-nosed political teaching. But we have to ask again, in the case of Mino, for whose good is this rule to be exercised? Your own good or the city's good? Because these two goods needn't always be identical. That this is a question or problem for Mino, Socrates brings out here with amazing speed. Socrates asks simply, uh, do you mean ruling people justly or unjustly, Mino? And Mino adds, justly, of course. So then the capacity to rule people is virtue, but then again, justice is virtue. What Mino has in mind, I think, is that the ability to rule people, to engage in politics at the highest level, is the greatest virtue, the, the greatest good for a man. But he adds only, of course, when it's done justly. There is then an absolutely necessary limit on the pursuit of that greatest good, political rule. But this means in turn that the thing that limits our pursuit of the greatest good must itself be more important than the supposedly greatest good. Being just in his, is in his mind also more important, a greater good, even than ruling people, because he wouldn't do it if he had to be unjust. There are two very great goods to which Mino is attracted. The exercise of great political rule, that's clear, and justice. But to be as blunt as possible here, if ruling truly is the greatest good for a human being, why should anybody ever give up some part of it in the name of justice or any other lesser good? 
Yet here, Mino wants to pursue only just rule. He wants to be just even more, apparently, than he wants to be a ruler under any circumstances. To this point, I think we've seen that virtue comprises two different elements or strands. The skills that you need to serve well a whole that's greater than oneself, the community or the family, and that which renders us good on the model of health. If there is a definition of virtue that, that adequately combines these two elements, Mino hasn't found it yet. But he's going to try to find it now, in his third definition, which I think at first blush is an odd one, and even a very odd one. Following now a certain unnamed poet rather than Gorgias, Mino now says that virtue is for someone who desires the noble things to be capable of providing them for himself. Well, we can begin to see where that Mino's going if we recall his first two definitions. First, a sort of dedication and service to a community. Second, ruling people, that is, being great yourself. Now, I suggest, Mino tries to bring these two things together in being dedicated to what he calls, following a poet, the noble things, that is, things that are noble or admirable. In its emphasis on what's noble, Definition number three would, would seem to have most in common with definition number one, a kind of dedication, a, a desire to possess what's noble. Everything, of course, depends on just what it is that Mino thinks is noble or admirable. Now, Socrates, for his part, immediately suggests that everything that's noble has to be also good. And this is a proposition that, that Mino hardly approves of. This step, I think, makes clear Mino's guiding hope, you could say, or belief. If you serve your city nobly, for example, justly and moderately, you too will be ben benefited thereby. This is what it means to say that everything noble must also be good, good or beneficial for you. Socrates goes on to take this basic agreement, or if you like, this statement of Mino's hope, that the noble things are fundamentally good for you, he takes that in an intriguing direction. Socrates corrects Mino's initial opinion that there are some people in the world who knowingly desire bad or harmful things. According to Socrates, the truth is that all human beings desire to possess for themselves the truly good things in all that they do. There are some who, out of a, a regrettable ignorance of what's truly good, unknowingly desire the bad things. This, then, is one statement of Socrates' famous dictum that all vice is ignorance or that no one willingly uh, or knowingly does what is bad. Now, I might just pause here to note that this is one of the places where Socrates' strangeness, his, his distance from ordinary opinion, clearly comes to sight. If you think through the view that all vice stems from ignorance, ignorance of what's good, you see that no one would willingly be deprived of such knowledge. Ignorance of what's truly good brings with it its own harsh penalty or punishment. But this suggests in turn that it makes no sense to blame anybody for his or her unwitting ignorance of what's truly good. And this thought goes a long way toward explaining, I suspect, Socrates' as remarkable his equanimity or, or calm and his rather amazing freedom from anger even at his own trial and even on the day of his execution. He didn't, strictly speaking, blame those who were acting badly because they did so out of an involuntary ignorance. But let's go back to the Mino. How does this argument about the necessary desire to attain the good things apply to the definition of, of virtue that's now on the table? Well, Mino had said, virtue is the capacity to attain the noble and hence good things that you desire. Now, however, it appears that everybody desires the good things, and only the good things. The difference then between the virtuous and the non-virtuous must consist in something other than this universal desire. The difference in question is found in the differing capacities of human beings to attain the good things. So virtue now is the capacity to attain for oneself the truly good things, that, things that all human beings desire. Well, as it seems to me, Socrates here focuses on one clear part 
of Mino's otherwise confused understanding of virtue, namely, the hope that, that virtue, understood as selfless dedication or, or even sacrifice, is ultimately good for you, for the virtuous themselves. And so, for the first time in the dialogue, happiness explicitly enters here, in this context, as the standard. This understanding of virtue does, I think, supply a coherent principle by which to unite the, the many and varied qualities of soul that would surely be needed to know what the truly good things are and to attain them for yourself. And so, accordingly, this revised third definition receives Socrates' highest praise yet. So it is a kind of watershed moment in the dialogue. Now, in the immediate sequel, in the next part of the dialogue, we learn two things. First, we learn how Mino conceives of the noble and hence good things. And then second, we learn that Mino cannot stick to the coherent principle that I've just sketched. So let's take up each one of these points in turn. Mino conceives of the following things as good. He lists gold, silver, political office, period. I think it's fair to say, in other words, that, Mi that, that he has, Mino has a very crude or narrow understanding of what's good for human beings, for him and for anyone. In short, money and power. And so Socrates here applies exactly the same argument that we've seen earlier. Uh, do you mean uh, that virtue is getting these things in any old way, Mino? Money, power, and so on? Or only justly and... Socrates now adds, interestingly, piously. And once again, Mino says, and I think he says sincerely, no, no, I mean only getting them justly and piously, only attaining money and power justly and piously, only then would it be virtuous. Now, we see a funny consequence, or at least a striking consequence, of this limitation. This limitation means that sometimes getting money and power would be virtue. And sometimes sacrificing money and power would be virtue. And so Mino here reverts to his old confusion. Virtue is attaining for yourself the truly good things. And virtue is acting justly and piously, whether or not you attain the good things in so acting. Now, at this point, I think it's worthwhile to ask ourselves how Mino might have made this third definition of virtue consistent, and therefore avoided getting tripped up yet again by Socrates? Well, one pos possible answer, I think, is this. If Mino had said that virtue is the providing the truly good things for oneself, and then refused to acknowledge any sensible limit on that provision, he could have made his third definition immune to Socrates' criticisms. To be clear, Mino could have said that nothing, not justice, not moderation, not courage, not piety, nothing should get in the way of the attainment of the truly good things that all human beings necessarily desire. If virtue equals attaining the greatest good for oneself, then sacrificing that very good can't be virtue. Now this is, of course, a shocking position to hold, I think. And Mino doesn't hold it. At any rate, Mino can't bring himself to hold it consistently. He is, for some reason, deeply attracted to the view that giving up the greatest goods for oneself is a noble or, or virtuous thing to do. And therefore, that giving up those goods must itself be good for you. In other words, Mino is deeply attracted to self-sacrifice, because he hopes that precisely self-sacrifice is the greatest good for you. Mino is confused, I think, about what it is that he most wants. To attain his own greatest good, or to sacrifice his own greatest good. Now, it's not surprising that at, at about this point, Mino rebels. He's had enough. He compares Socrates famously to a stingray that numbs those who touch it. As Mino had heard, even before he got together with Socrates, 
Socrates makes anyone who speaks to him feel utterly perplexed and unable to speak. And here Socrates states, what his, uh, rather Mino states, what has become known as his paradox. Mino's paradox is this. How can you define or identify something when you don't know what it is? And how will you know it, even if you happen right across it? It's like the common complaint of, how do I look up a word in a dictionary if I don't know how to spell it? How will I know what virtue is if I don't know what virtue is? Mino, in other words, now despairs of rational inquiry altogether. He has thrown in the towel. Now, here we have to pay some attention to the drama of the dialogue, as always. Socrates wants Mino to press on, or not to despair of reason altogether. And so Socrates has to buck up Mino's spirits. This is the first and the most important purpose of the section that we're now considering, which includes both the doctrine of recollection and the famous conversation with Mino's slave, to encourage Mino to continue. And as we can see by looking at the end of this section, Socrates is successful in this. What Socrates tells Mino here is enough to get him to say, okay, we'll go on. So what does Socrates tell him? Well, he relies here on the testimony of certain unnamed priests and priestesses and divine poets, he says. And he, he asserts, Socrates asserts, that our soul is immortal, or more precisely, that it has been reborn many times. And as a result, he says, it has seen the soul, it, it has seen all things, both here and in Hades, the, the Greek underworld. And among the things that it has seen or learned is virtue. And so, he says, we just need now not to learn what virtue is, but merely recollect it. The knowledge, Mino, is in you. It's in your soul. It just needs to be recovered or roused. This, in a nutshell, is the famous doctrine of recollection. Now, as I hope even my quick summary suggests, Socrates doesn't prove any of these far-reaching assertions. He doesn't prove the immortality of the soul, for example, the fact that our soul has learned all things, and so on. In fact, I think you could even say that Socrates' statement here begs the decisive question. He assumes, rather than proves, that virtue is among the things that can be learned. So there are many questions or protests that, that Mino here could raise. But what does he ask? Only this. Tell me, Socrates, how is learning recollection? In other words, he appears at least to accept, without further ado, the immortality of the soul, to give only the most important example, which I'll return to in our next lecture. Um, we're going to pick up in the next lecture with Socrates' clarification or proof of the recollection doctrine by means uh, of his conversation with the slave. And then we'll examine the remaining two sections of the dialogue.